Today we're standing at the window of St. Francis of Assisi, and in this particular image you'll notice that he's in a brown robe, which is what many Franciscans continue to wear today, and it's also the robe that Francis, Francis himself wore. It also has these three knots, and those are for the evangelical councils, the vows that many religious take, that of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And you also see him holding a cross. We'll show why that's significant, say why that's significant in a few moments. And we see some birds. We certainly know Francis was a lover of nature. St. Francis in our modern age is perhaps one of the most popular saints that there are. And even though he's the most popular, he's often the most misunderstood. So often when we think of Francis, we picture him just out preaching to birds and loving all of creation and just being almost like a, like a hippie of some sort. Francis was obviously much more serious than that. He was a disciple of Christ, and he was also a faithful member of the church. Francis, when Dante was, was a very famous author, when he was alluding to the birth of St. Francis, and he said more about him, he started by saying that a son was born into the world. And he wanted to show how significant the birth of St. Francis was. Francis, there seems to be some discrepancy. He was either born in the latter half of 1881, or he was born in the early part of 1882. So again, there seems to be some discrepancy. He was from a very wealthy family. His father was a very successful cloth merchant. And when he was born, his mother had a makeshift manger placed on the ground so that he could be born in a manger in imitation of Christ. His mom immediately brought him to the font to be baptized, and he was given the name of Giovanni, and he was given that name after St. John the Baptist. His father nicknamed him Francesco, which is where we get Francis from, and nicknamed him that because his father had a love of all things French. When Francis was young, he led a carefree life. He didn't have many problems. He was very well respected among his peers, and he did much, you know, just much in a carefree way. Liked to play practical jokes, liked to do simple things like that. And because he was so popular, because he was from such a wealthy family, one author commented that he had a seductive charm. He was the king of all youth, and all was forgiven him because of that. So we see a little bit about how his early life shaped out. At the age of 20, his region, Assisi, was going to battle with Perugia, a neighboring Italian village, and so Francis enlisted in the army. His army was defeated, and so Francis eventually was put in prison, which lasted about a year or so. And after that, he was able to return to Assisi, but because of the time in prison, he was very sick and he was very weary. He began to, began to have some change, some conversion, because after, as he started to get a little better, he decided to go into southern Italy, and he was going to fight for the papal army. And as he was doing that, he made a stop in a particular town, and he heard a voice say to him, follow the master, not the man. And because of that, he returned to Assisi, and he began to start a life of prayer, more prayer than he had in the past, and he gave up his old ways of partying and doing all the other stuff he was doing. His moment of true conversion, as he himself said, happened when he was riding a horse one day through town, and on the side of the street, he noticed a leper. St. Francis always had an aversion prior to this. He had an aversion to those who were sick, and in particular, he had an aversion to, the, um, to lepers. And what he did, which probably even shocked himself, when he saw this leper, he dismounted his horse, and he kissed the hands of the leper. St. Francis said that was when his moment of conversion began. Sometime after that, not too long, it was in the year 1205, he was praying in the church of San Damiano. And as he was praying there, he was praying before a particular crucifix. And as he was praying before this particular crucifix, through three times he heard from the cross, Francis, go and repair my church, which you can see is in ruins. And he heard that message three times. And because of that, Francis took the message rather literally. So what he did was he went into his father's warehouse and he took all this cloth and without his father knowing, and he sold all that, and he asked the parish priest if he could stay at the parish in order to rebuild the parish. At this time, he began to dress in rags, and he began to beg for food. This brought a lot of shame on his family, so eventually his father had him shackled, brought him to the house, and basically locked him in prison in their own house. Eventually, his mother freed him so that he could not have to be in shackles in his own house. As soon as that happened, Francis went back to San Damiano, and he continued to actually physically rebuild the church. 
At this time, his father brought some charges against him because he found out that he had stolen all that cloth, and so he had Francis brought before the bishop. And he said, you either have to pay the money back or you have to renounce your family patrimony. And Francis did something very dramatic at that time. Francis said, the clothes I have are his as well. I'll give them back. And there before the bishop, there before his parents, there before a whole group of townspeople who had gathered, Francis renounced his family inheritance and stripped naked of all his clothes. It is said that the bishop at that time was so moved that he, had been, that he wept over this, and he eventually put the cope around Francis. Francis, sometime after that, decided that he was going to spend all of his time praying, helping the poor and sick, and begging for alms. It was in the year 1208, while he was at Mass, that he heard that passage from Matthew chapter 10, where the apostles are told they have a mission to preach, and they're also told to take nothing with them on their journey. And again, Francis took this very literally, so he went out, took off his shoes, took off his tunic, and gave them to someone who was poor, and then he took on a cloak of the shepherds, a very simple cloak of the shepherds, and he tied a waist, a cord around his waist. That is still what many Franciscans continue to wear in honor of what St. Francis did. And so at that time, he goes about preaching, and he begins to beg for alms, and a lot of people begin to be attracted to his way of life, including even a well-to-do merchant and even a, law a lawyer. They live in a small cottage, and they begin, Francis begins to instruct them on what their life as religious is going to be like. And it's sometime around this time when Pope Innocent III, he was, had a dream, and in this dream, he saw the Basilica of St. John Lateran, which is one of the most prominent basilicas in all of Rome. He had the dream of that basilica crashing to the ground. And then he had, a, in that dream, he also saw an insignificant brother holding up the basilica with his shoulders. If you ever go to St. John Lateran today, the basilica's here, across the street, you can see this image of St. Francis standing like this, and if you look at it from a certain angle, it almost looks like he's holding that whole entire basilica up. So even at that place, there is a reminder of this dream. And this is significant because St. Francis eventually started to compose a rule because people were being attracted to him, and he eventually went to Rome to get approval for that rule. And when he went there, he met Pope Innocent III, and Innocent III immediately recognized him from the dream. And he gave unofficial, he gave approval for their order, and he even canonically gave them the tonsure, which is where they cut off some of your hair, so you're bald on the top. I've never been tonsured, this is natural. And so even though that happened, Pope Innocent, there were many there who were complaining that the rule was too simple and it shouldn't be accepted. Pope Innocent, because he recognized him from that dream, said he's going to give approval to that. His successor, Pope Innocent the third successor, who was Pope Honorius III, if I'm not mistaken, he gives eventually full canonical approval to the Franciscans, and he releases a papal bull about them. And this was after some time because the order had grown so dramatically and increased in such numbers that all the people, all the monks who were all the friars who were joining couldn't be around Francis, so they had to adapt the rule so that it could grow into this flourishing body when everyone couldn't be around Francis. There were some compromises in that, that new constitution for the rule of the Franciscans, and that bothered St. Francis a bit. He still accepted it because he knew that was what was appropriate for that time. Sometime after he met Pope Innocent III, he was ordained a deacon, and even though he was ordained a deacon, he would never go on to receive holy orders. He would never go on to the priesthood. And he did that because he was so humble, he didn't think himself worthy to receive received the vows of the, received the priesthood. Eventually the friars were given the chapel of the Porcincula in the parish of Santa Maria, and they were given that to be their foundation house. And as that happened, they wanted to actually give the whole property to the Franciscans and the group around St. Francis, and Francis was so utterly convinced that they shouldn't own property that he insisted that every year they pay rent for that property because they didn't want to own it. They began to travel throughout Italy, and they were itinerant preachers, they would beg for alms, and they began to have such an impact on the culture at that time. People were so, so convicted by their simplicity of life and also their call to conversion. The church at that time it was very lax, the clergy, the people, 
And so we see in particular with Francis and during his time that God always raises up the saints he needs for a particular age. And with that laxity of that time, the church really needed such a strong example like we see in the person of St. Francis. Again, the order did go on to grow immensely, and many, many began to join the order because of that. St. Francis at this time, as he's going about preaching, one thing he had a desire for was he wanted to go and convert the Muslims. And so eventually he's able to set up a meeting with the Sultan Malik of Kamil, and he wants to convince him to convert to his faith. Even though the sultan never converted, they did have a very cordial meeting, and Francis was able to meet with the sultan and exchange some ideas. Supposedly, this may or may not be true, the sultan said to him as he was leaving, I would convert to your religion, which is a beautiful one, but I cannot. We would both be massacred because of that. So again, whether that's true or not, we certainly did see there was some impact on the sultan because of the visit of St. Francis. St. Francis then also has a strong desire to go to the Holy Land, so he goes to the Holy Land and he vi um, visits all the holy sites and he ministers to the people at that time. Importantly, even today, the Franciscans still have custody of many of the most important um, shrines in the Holy Land, and that's because of how important the Holy Land was to St. Francis. It was sometime around the year 1227, possibly, when, um, Saint, when the first martyrs of the Franciscans took place, and that took place in Mongolia, and that also took place in China. So kind of a unique factor that even when he was still alive, some of his own religious brothers were martyred. Around this time, St. Clair comes to Assisi, and she wants to found an order of women to support the, work, to support the mission of the brothers, and so Francis allows her to do that. He cuts off her hair as an act of total poverty. And when that happens, a group of women gather around her and they become known as the Poor Ladies of San Damiano. Eventually they become to be called the Poor Clares. If you've ever visited Mother Angelica Shrine or you've watched DWTN, those are a group of sisters who are Poor Clares in our world today. And in the year, excuse me, in the year 1221, he establishes the Third Order of Penitents, which allows men and women to, who are not going to become religious brothers or sisters to be part of the order, and they are able to wear the habit even though they're not able to wear it in public. And so these are lay people who have some connection with Franciscan spirituality. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shortly after that, there begins to be some tension. The order had grown so much, there begins to be tension and division within the order. And so because of that, Francis no longer says he wants to be the minister general of the order. And so he hands that position over to someone else, someone who might be able to heal some of those divisions and some of that bitterness that had started. In Christmas of 1223, in Greccio, he decides to set up a memorial of the Christmas nativity scene. So he wants to kind of recreate in earthly fashion the Christmas nativity scene. And so he does just that. He makes a memorial of the nativity scene. That's most likely the first nativity scene that was ever placed anywhere in the world. And even if it wasn't the very first, which most likely it could have been, he was certainly someone who made the nativity scene popular. So without St. Francis, we may not even have Christmas nativity scenes in our church around Christmas. In the year 1224, he goes to the mountains and he's going to live in isolation. He goes to the mountains in La Verana, um, which is not far from Assisi. And as he's there, he's praying before a crucifix once again. We can tell these crucifixes keep being important in the life of St. Francis. And as that's happening, he has a vision of the crucified Christ. And what happens is he receives the stigmata. He receives the wounds of Christ in his hands, also his feet, and on his side. So Francis receives the wounds of Christ. He's the first known person to receive the stigmata. And this was very painful for him, and it was also very humbling for him. He didn't want people to notice, so he began to cover his hands with gloves, his habit, and he would also cover his socks. Again, the first known person to receive the stigmata, which is obviously very important. Around that time, he also is getting ready for his final days. And his passing was certainly a painful one. He had a serious eye infection that left him either partially blind, maybe to uh, totally blind. He had some serious stomach ailments that affected him. And so he was in much pain. 
During that time, he asks, he wants to make one last visit to St. Clair. So he goes to St. Clair at San Damiano, where he received the first vision from the cross that said, repair my house, repair the church. And as that happens, when he's with St. Clair, he composes the Canticle of the Sun, which is one of the most famous writings of St. Francis. And he asks, as he's getting ready to die, he asks that he be laid on the ground so that he can die on the ground. And he puts on a very simple old habit so that he can die that way. And eventually he does pass. And as he passes, he passes very, very peacefully on October 3rd, even in the midst of such a painful period that led up to his death. He asked to be buried in the criminal cemetery. His brothers had such affection for him that they wouldn't allow that, so they processed his body all throughout the streets of Assisi, and then they eventually laid him to rest in the Basilica of Assisi. It was only two years after his death that he was canonized a saint. We obviously know Francis had a concern for the poor. He had a concern for the environment. He had many things that are practical and relatable to us today, perhaps none greater than the Eucharist. And he even said of the Eucharist, he said, let everyone be struck with fear, let the whole world tremble, and let the heavens exalt with Christ, the Son of the living God, who is present on the altar in the hands of the priest. O stupendous dignity, O humble sublimity, that the Lord of the universe, God, and the Son of God, so humble himself that for our salvation he hides himself under an ordinary piece of bread. The remains of St. Francis are at the Basilica in Assisi. There's these beautiful frescoes that were painted by a very famous painter of that time, and they depict the life of St. Francis. A beautiful place to be if you've never been there. And obviously it's a little far, so you have to really make a um, trip to go there. And if you ever have been to Assisi or you ever get to go there, it's almost like a town that hasn't changed with time. There's these cobblestone streets. It looks like you're in the 12th century. It looks like you're just during the time of St. Francis. It's very quiet, it's very peaceful, even with all the pilgrimages, and you just feel like you've stepped back in time. Another, another unique place to visit in the spirit of St. Francis, because he had such a devotion to the Holy Land in Washington, D.C., there is the Franciscan Monastery of the Holy Land, which is a very unique place. It has all these replicas of the important holy sites in the Holy Land. And so that's always a place. There's many, obviously, churches. There's many places that you can go to foster devotion to St. Francis. When our church is open, you can certainly stop for a moment and pray before this image of St. Francis. And I have, I guess, some connection because I also went to the Franciscan University of Steubenville, so I do certainly have some connection with St. Francis. I'm going to share with you just a few books that you may, may or may not want to, if you so desire. This first one, I would say this is probably the best one, and amazingly, you can order anything on Amazon. All these books can be ordered on Amazon. This one is probably the most important. It's called The Life of St. Francis of Assisi and the Treaties of Miracles, and it's written by Brother Thomas of Solano. The reason this is so important is Brother Thomas of Solano actually lived with St. Francis for some time. So this really is a firsthand account of what happened to the life of St. Francis. During the latter half of the book, he probably was not around St. Francis, so he relied on testimony a little more, um, a little more than a l testimony from others for that part of the time. So that's probably the best book you can get on St. Francis. For all these windows, and we have these in the parish library, it's called The Butler's Lives of the Saints, and you can take any of these from the library and you can read about a particular saint. St. Francis' feast day is on October 4th, so if you ever want to borrow the October one and learn more about the life of St. Francis, again, this is a wonderful resource. You can buy it on Amazon, and there's one volume for each month, and it's very detailed about the lives of the saints. Another one which I don't have, which I eventually would like to get, it's by G.K. Chesterton, who was a famous English author. He was a kind of a modern commentator on you know, political affairs and religious affairs, and he wrote a book, only two books on the saints, one on Thomas Aquinas and one on St. Francis. It's kind of unique because they're so different from one another. Having read some of his other books, I like his style very much. It's very practical, very accessible. He's very witty, and he wrote something on Francis, so I certainly would recommend that. And also this one, um, it's called The Image of Christ, St. Francis of Assisi, and it's by Dietrich von Hildebrand, who was a famous theologian in the church in, uh, in the, probably the 19th century, or 20th century, I'm sorry. The last one, this is from, I couldn't believe we didn't have any books on St. Francis in the parish library, 
I must have missed them. We have to have at least one. The only one I saw about Franciscans from the parish library outside the Butler's Lives of the Saints is Claire and her sisters, lovers of the poor Christ. So if you ever want more on just St. Claire, uh, this is in the parish library. So I imagine this could fill you with some joy knowing the spirit of St. Francis is with us and he's with us because he's present in these glasses at St. Catherine's Church and we certainly know that continues to console us. So God bless. Thanks for watching.